Hello Ecotopians. Today we're talking about climate and weather for Ecotopia. Uh, this is a really exciting topic for me because I absolutely love the weather. Um, I don't really know why. I think it's because I feel hmm, like it's some great big force that's outside human control and um, I kind of like that that there's stuff outside of human control and it come it brings all kinds of wonderful things it brings us uh, warm days and it brings us rain that we can drink and that keeps the uh, forests growing green and it blows in the birds and I love snow and all kinds of things so I have tried to uh, limit my enthusiasm into uh, 25 or 26 slides and give a pretty, uh, in my view, brief overview of weather, uh, but I hope you enjoy it. Here's exactly what I'm trying to get out of this section of Ecotopia. First, I want you to know the water cycle, which you probably already do because most kindergartners and third graders know, know it. Uh, we'll just review it quickly and know the difference between climate and weather and do not confuse the two. Uh, understand Hadley cells, Hadley cells and you. That might be something new to you. Uh, know that we're in a Mediterranean climate. What is it and why are we there? Look at our local weather patterns, the ones on the north coast. Understand the interaction between high and low pressure systems. That's when we start getting really nerdy about weather and understand the sequence of events surrounding a winter storm which is great if you live on the north coast during a winter storm and you've learned your lessons from this you'll know exactly what's going on outside and you'll be paying attention which is in my opinion a good thing uh, also understand summertime fog on the north coast which is nice it helps you plan your day and of course these things are all very uh, important to the redwoods and explain microclimate variation and topography in redwood country and visit the National Weather Service website which is uh, uh, an assignment coming up for you guys soon and start thinking about dum, 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 climate change in redwood country okay just start thinking about it if you haven't already okay so let's start with the water cycle here it is uh, hopefully you know it um, water uh, exists in three forms on the planet liquid vapor and solid forms the solid forms being very cold and very nice to ski and skate on the liquid forms being uh, fresh or salty the salt the oceans being like the bath water of the continents for billions of years the continents have been washed with rain and everything soluble inland has gone out into the ocean where it still is unless it sediments out anyway oceans are salty and they give off a lot of uh, water vapor uh, which rises into the atmosphere uh, water vapor also comes from the land and it also comes from wet fresh water so water vapor is rising into the atmosphere where as it cools it condenses and forms fog and then falls down as precipitation uh, either uh, you know snow or rain or hail okay and then it falls on the land and it runs off and uh, that's all cool what most people don't really understand is that uh, part of the water cycle is what's underground and there's a lot of water underground and it comes out it we see it in springs and uh, it seeps into rivers and lakes uh, we tap into it with our wells uh, but there's a lot of it there it's just invisible so people don't think about it very much but every step you take is over groundwater down there somewhere is water my mother recently sent me an email saying they found a diamond or something like that that proves that there's a huge amount of water way down deep in the crust which is pretty cool so I guess the water cycle can go deep into the earth okay that's it for the water cycle Okay, number two, know the difference between climate and weather. Quote, climate's what you expect, weather's what you get. That quote was is often attributed to uh, uh, Mark Twain, um, but as a critical thinker, I look for sources, and I found a source that said, no, nah, not so much, it wasn't Mark Twain. Nobody really knows who originated it, Origin who made it up, um, but it doesn't matter, it, it, uh, it sums up the difference between climate and weather pretty 
pretty well. Uh, climate's what you expect. Climate is the weather conditions prevailing in an area over a long period of time. It's not what you have today. Weather is the state of the atmosphere at a place and time as regards heat, dryness, sunshine, wind, rain, etc. So today's weather here in Arcata looks like it's cool and cloudy where I am. Uh, our climate is something different altogether. Um, I get kind of upset when there's a spell of extra cold weather or extra um, large amounts of snow or even extra hot weather and people say, see, this proves climate change or climate change. They said it's climate change and we just had a record cold temperature. I'm sorry, you are referring to the weather, not the climate. Two different things. Get them straight. Uh, so you're interested in the weather. I just want to point out that the best place, in my humble opinion, to find about the weather is at the National Weather Service. Um, the federal government has its failings, but man, the National Weather Service is awesome. So check it out. I'm just going to show you. I open it up, and here is the Eureka office of the National Weather uh, Service. Uh, you want some other place? Uh, you can. Let's see if this works. New York, New York. Nah. How about uh, New York City, New York? They like that? They don't. Oh, how about this? One, two, six, oh, three. Okay, where is this? Poughkeepsie, New York. Okay, it's where I'm from. Okay, so I'm going to go back to Eureka. Here we are. Here's our local weather, and uh, it's a clickable map. And look, man, there is lots of information here and uh, I will be creating an assignment for you guys to delve into this and find some climate information but if you just want today's weather this is a great place in fact right now all you got to do is click on the satellite and you see that mm, nothing much is happening although there is some rain forecast for uh, later this evening see rain coming up um, all that's cool. Um, it is. There's lots of great stuff, as I mentioned. But if you want to get very geeky about it, you come down here to the forecast discussion. Click on it. And here is, uh, let's see, who is this guy? Oh, come on. They always sign at the end. Hmm. I don't see it. Usually, oh, I guess it's usually the, uh, the, the uh, meteorologist. Um, puts on his initials or her initials at the end. Anyway, this is the meteorologists uh, speaking to other people who understand meteorology speak. And so if you really want to get the real information, read this. It's hard to understand, but I I'm, I've, have no training as a meteorologist, but I read these all the time and I do my research and I find out what they're talking about and it's taught me a lot. So you can't always trust these things to tell you the truth. I mean, what is 20% chance of isolated showers? And what time is this rain coming, do they think? Uh, and later on, do they really know this or not? Well, you can get the real information from these other guys. Okay, so the National Weather Service website is totally cool. Let's talk about climate. So here's this gorgeous satellite picture, full disk satellite uh, of the Earth um, recently. And uh, wow, look what's going on. We've got bands of clouds and we have dry areas uh, and other stuff going on. And so what I want to do now is talk about climate. Different parts of the Earth experience different kinds of climate. Duh, of course, there's huge deserts in some parts of the world and other places are, are like tropical paradises and other places are cold. And why is that? How come, how can we understand climate on the face of the earth? Okay, so let's start really simply. Uh, you really have to understand that warm air rises and cool air sinks. And so here's a place where the earth is being heated by the sun, which is the driver of all weather on the planet, the sun. And uh, so when the sun hits the land, it warms it up. And when it warms air, warm air rises relative to nearby colder air. So warm, low pressure air rises. So low pressure, uh, it's just like sucking on a straw. When you suck on a straw, you create low pressure and you pull stuff up. 
So warm air rises, but then when it goes high enough, it starts diverging. It starts going over. Also, precipitation happens, if you remember your water cycle. Uh, condensation happens, and then precipitation. Maybe you get storms developing. And I'm going to go to the next slide to show you that um, after that warm air moves away from the warm area, um, and it has lost its water, it is starts condensing it becomes cool dry high pressure okay so cool dry air is dense and it falls and it warms as it falls which is kind of cool so um, low pressure air as you condense it as it gets deeper in the atmosphere it gets condensed and actually becomes warmer and even drier okay so let's put these two things together the the um, convection where the sun is heating up the earth and then over here where that um, formerly warm wet air drops as cool, cool dry air let's put it together on the face of the earth so um, the earth is heated unevenly by the sun the equator tends to get a lot more sun than the poles so this place warms up more and so this is a band of convection warm moist air rising into the atmosphere cooling and condensing in what is called the intertropical convergence zone the ITCZ intertropical convergence zone and that's pretty cool if you live there every day uh, when the sun hit the earth about midday that you get clouds forming you get a little bit of rainfall and then it clears up again day after day after day uh, but what happens to this air after it leaves this area remember the air rises and then it diverges and it comes this way and at some point it falls down it's going to be cooler and drier uh, let's take a look at that that should be an A a Hadley cell this is a cross-section sort of cutout of the Earth's atmosphere with the equator here and that is the place where the warm air is rising and we have the intertropical convergence zone and we have this hot air coming up and moving northward and southward but we're just going to go northward here and it drops here at 30 degrees about 30 degrees north latitude which puts us uh, I don't know Los Angeles Baja something like that okay so this is cool dry air that warms as it drops and so this is a zone on the earth of the earth's greatest deserts the Mojave Desert uh, the Sonora Desert the Gobi Desert um, the Sahara Desert and in the southern hemisphere the same thing happens with the uh, other half of the Hadley cell at 30 degrees south and we get the deserts of the skeleton coast in Namibia we get the deserts of um, Australia the great outback there so we have definitely differences of climate um, at the equator and at 30 degrees north so just note that Arcata is at 41 degrees north latitude so where is that somewhere between 30 and 60 someplace here someplace north but not very far north of the area the desert area okay so now you kind of understand why Los Angeles is hot and dry and we're not so hot and dry and as you go farther north you get cooler and more moist so Hadley cells uh, you don't have to know about the feral cell you don't have to know about the polar cell cell just for the purposes of this class know that the weather is kind of complicated as you get farther north I wanted to mention one other thing. Now, the Coriolis effect is not a concept that I want you to memorize for this class. I won't test you on it, but I still think it's useful to know about. Um, the idea here is that the Earth is spinning on its axis, which means that uh, someone standing in one place here, in, if they didn't move for 24 hours, uh, they would just turn, make one rotation. They wouldn't travel very far at all on the surf, uh, uh, in space. However, if you're standing on the equator in one day, you've got to go all the way around the diameter of the Earth, which is thousands of miles. And so actually you have velocity as you stand on the Earth. And if you were, I guess this is a cannon, but let's just say you're a blind uh, airline pilot and you took off from the equator and headed north um, and you didn't do anything else you're actually going pretty fast and uh, relative to these guys here which are going slow and so your pathway would actually deflect to the east which is just 
really kind of cool and bizarre that you think you're going north uh, but you actually start moving in this direction um, and the reverse is true in the south what this means to weather and climate is that in the Hadley cells as the air from the equator moves northward it's deflected to the right or the east in the northern hemisphere and what that means also is that in these latitudes um, the weather generally moves from west to east. It's really fascinating. It gets much more complicated. Don't have time to go into it now, but it gives you some idea on why the weather is so, or climate is so complicated on Earth. It has to do with this spinning globe and convection currents. This map here, let's see, um, global atmospheric circulation, had more on Hadley cells. Um, so where are the Hadley cells? Oh, they're over on the right now. So you can see them rising, going this way, and dropping here. And um, what this is showing is actually the return, the surface winds here. Um, in our latitude, which is right about here, 41 degrees, we have prevailing winds from the west, westerlies, from the west. So our weather comes from the west and we're on the west coast of North America so our weather is always coming from the over the Pacific Ocean. Sometimes more from the north, sometimes more from the south, but continuously from the west. Kind of nice to know. And if you, uh, when you get rich and you retire and you buy a yacht and you go sailing around the world, you're going to want to know a lot about these prevailing winds. Because if you want to go to Hawaii, you want to catch these uh, winds right here. But you don't want to get becalmed in the doldrums, which happens, so and so forth. So um, write me a postcard when you do that and tell me how it's going. Hadley cells. Make sure you know them and understand them. Also, make sure you know that we're at uh, 41 degrees latitude. That's a nice little thing to know. You should know your address. Okay. Oh, yeah. Let's, I just want to show you this. There's this animation here. I'm just going to play it for you. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, um, it's kind of cool. The palomar.edu has this. And uh, you can turn all sorts of things on. And I think I'm going to keep the Hadley cell profile on. I'm going to mm, I'll hide the intertropical convergent zone because you pretty much know where it is. I'm going to leave the high and low pressure zones and um, when I play it it's going to start in January and go through the year and as I do that keep your eye on this H. It's called the subtropical high. It's where the um, air from the Hadley cell is descending. This is the hot dry air and notice how it moves. Now if it moves to the north it makes us hot and dry. If it moves to the south then it allows other kinds of weather to come down and give us rain and so watch the precipitation as it changes. Precipitation is in green here. Okay here we go. Uh, I'm going to stop it here in spring. You've noticed that this has gotten bigger and our rain has gone away. Here it is June at the summer solstice. The, this big high pressure system is right there and it's pushing all the rain away. We're not getting much rain here in June or July or August but in September you see it's shrinking. We usually get our first rains in September, October, November and boom we've got rain again here in November and so on and so forth. Okay so um, this is kind of showing you a little bit how the global climate changes generally. This last winter we had kind of a drought from oh, practically September through February. It's still a drought. We just got some rain. Um, and it was because this guy here was exceptionally large and persistent and it was hard for these low pressure systems to break through. So uh, we didn't get much rain this year. Okay, uh, let's see. Great. The other thing I wanted to point out is um, that affecting the climate is the ocean. And surface winds drive oceanic currents which are also affected by temperature and continents. So um, these don't change though. They don't change nearly as much as the weather does, but these are set up by atmospheric circulation and the Coriolis effect. What I really want, you, the two things I want you to get out of this. Number one is that um, 
the temperature has a very strong effect on I'm sorry the oceans temperature has a very strong effect on the atmospheric temperature so if there's nice warm water coming up it's going to warm up the air and put a lot of moisture in the air if the water is very cold it doesn't matter how much sun you're getting you're going to feel chilly if the water comes across the ocean the ocean is a huge thermal sink and so it regulates air temperature not vice versa the second thing I want you to get out of this is that in California, um, the prevailing currents come from the North Pacific and then strike the continent. So it's fairly cooled water. Also, as it strikes the continent, there's an upwelling effect. So deep, extra cold water upwells along the coast of California. And so that actually has a big effect, uh, a huge effect, really, on coastal California within a couple miles of the coast. And we'll come back to that later when we talk about fog. OK, uh, I also just wanted to point out that because the weather is moving in this direction, uh, places on the west side of an ocean will be relatively warmer and wetter than places on the east side of the ocean. And so that's why at corresponding latitudes in the United States, um, there's a very different climate. These guys are warmed by the Gulf Stream, whereas we are cooled by this upwelling cool stuff. OK, so we have very different climate and weather. OK, next slide. Uh, the other thing um, I wanted to point out should be obvious that seasonality has a huge impact on both climate and weather. So, so climate is what happens long term. And you'd say, well, sure, over you know, centuries, thousands of years, uh, it's been warmer here in summer. And then in winter, it's been colder. And so we have snow in winter, and we don't have snow in summer. OK, but it also affects our day to day weather, which you guys should be noticing um, in your um, backyard observations. So um, for dates, you should uh, uh, commit to memory. Um, let's start where we are, sort of. We're just after the vernal equinox, March 20th, where we have equal hours of, well, of sun up and sun down. Okay, e not light and dark, but when the sun is above the sky and below the horizon, uh, March is, uh, is the spring equinox, March 20th. Now, summertime uh, uh, begins on the summer solstice, which is June 21st, which is our longest day of the year. And then in fall, on the September 22nd, we have the autumnal equinox, which is uh, corresponds to the spring equinox. Again, equal hours of sun up and sun down. And then in winter, right around Christmas, we have December 21st, the winter solstice. So these are events that humans have known about for as long, pretty much, as they've been keeping calendars and watching the sun. And we have many holidays right around these events, Easter and Christmas, and uh, hmm, not quite sure what we celebrate, Halloween. Um, and gee, I don't know if we celebrate anything on the summer solstice. We should, someone should start a holiday. July 4th? Not really. OK, anyway, so um, the seasonality greatly affects our weather, which, as we'll talk about when we talk about the Mediterranean climate, um, is very closely related to seasonality. So let's talk specifically about climate and weather for us. Uh, and I just got this image from the National Weather Service just today. And you can see that um, looks like it's pretty clear today. And but there's something offshore. And we're going to talk about that. It's important for you to understand when you're thinking about the weather, high pressure systems and low pressure systems. We talked in terms of the Hadley cell of high and low pressure systems. Low pressure where the air was rising, high pressure where the air was sinking, and that applies really nicely to Hadley cells and the intertropical convergent zone. But it's a little bit more complicated up here farther away from the tropics. Here's all I want you to know. High pressure systems tend to be clear. They can be cold or hot, but they don't have much water in them. Also, uh, well, I'll say in a second, low pressure systems uh, tend to have a lot of water associated with them. And um, that's about, I wanted to say about that. Other thing is that 
air moves from high pressure to low pressure. So if you're sucking on a straw, you're creating low pressure. If you're blowing on the straw, you're pushing the air away. Pretty straightforward. But it, notice that the air currents don't go directly in a straight line from high to low. Instead, they are deflected by that funny Coriolis effect. So the other thing I want you to know about uh, high and low pressure systems is that high pressure systems, the air rotates in a clockwise fashion as it comes away from it, clockwise. Whereas air coming into a low pressure system is comes in at a counterclockwise way. And I could never remember that until I came up with a mnemonic for it, which goes like this. Um, in your kitchen, your counter is low, but your clock is high. Okay, so if you ever forget, just think, uh, let's see, high, high clock. Okay, so air is coming out of a high pressure system clockwise. This is going to be important when we try to predict the weather in our area. So here's a, a map that shows a low pressure system over the United States and a high pressure or a ridge here. Now, it's, why do they call it a ridge? Well, I don't know, because a ridge is high. Uh, but note that this, this is going to be clear, cold or hot, uh, but without any clouds or low, low amount of clouds, whereas your low pressure system is going to be associated with, with water and precipitation, especially where the two meet. So uh, air spirals out of a high pressure system and then it spirals into a low pressure system. And when these winds get set up between them, they suck in air from other locations. So if it sucks in air from up north, that's going to be cold air. Cold air is going to come rushing down here and these poor guys in the Midwest are going to be freezing. Whereas um, over here, uh, this low pressure system is going to be sucking air in from down here. And if it comes from, say, the Gulf of Mexico, it's going to be warm and moist. And that's going to bring moisture up to the northern area. And where a cold, no, I'm sorry, where warm, moist air meets cold air, they, you get condensation and you get precipitation and you get storms. So these guys, as I mentioned before, move, all our weather moves generally from the west to the east. So this low pressure system is going to move this way, this is going to move this way, and from someone on the ground, they're going to be seeing shifting weather patterns as these systems move overhead. And what we're going to do soon is imagine what happens when there's a low pressure system off the uh, North American coast that brings a storm to Arcata and I'll, I'll tell you how that happens or what to predict shortly. But first, before, well, I want to finish up on climate. I said we live in a Mediterranean climate. Mediterranean climate is defined as an area that has cool damp winters, rarely freezes, and hot dry summers. All right. I mentioned earlier that I'm from New York originally, and uh, we didn't have cool, damp winters. We had cold, damp winters um, that froze a lot. Uh, we had hot summers, but they weren't necessarily dry because air would come up from the south and would bring precipitation with it. So um, that was not a Mediterranean climate. But on approximately the same latitude over here, we do have a Mediterranean climate. So um, you find these climates not very many places on the Earth. You can see in purple. Uh, in the Mediterranean, there's a Mediterranean climate. In parts of Australia, the very tip of, of Africa, and in part of South America, at 40 degrees north latitude. So this is right north of the area of the Great Deserts. Okay, So we are affected by that um, descending air from the Hadley cells, particularly in summertime. That expands and affects our weather, and so we get hot and dry. But as that descending air retreats southwards in winter, then we tend to get um, precipitation. But we're far enough south that it doesn't freeze very much, as long as you're not high up in the mountains. Okay, that's the Mediterranean climate. A good time for you to get up and stretch if you're starting to lose concentration. But that's up to you and your pause button. I'm moving on. So let's talk about a winter storm sequence here in uh, Redwood Country. So what I've done is I've, I've zoomed in on our map and put our location with this asterisk. And you can see that right now there's no clouds, but offshore there's a band of clouds associated with this spiraling pattern. Why is it spiraling? Because that is a low pressure system up there. Low, let's see, low counter. The counter in the kitchen is low. So uh, um, 
circulation around this low pressure system is counterclockwise. So this stuff is coming in and spiraling in around. Uh, it is sucking cold air down in its wake. So as this low pressure system moves, cold Arctic air is going to come down here. Uh, down here we have a high pressure system. A uh, high clock. So winds from here are going clockwise. Well, from the center. So clockwise. Oh no, clockwise would be clockwise would be like this. So we're having westerly winds, pretty much directly west, maybe even northwesterly winds, which is typical when a high pressure system dominates on us. Okay, but where this? Uh, let's see. Where this high Let's see, how am I going to say this? This is cold air. This is going to be warm air. Where the cold air and the warm air meet, we'll get a lot of wind coming up, bringing a band of mm, humid air from the south. South is going to be warmer and humid air that's going to contact this colder air and it's not going to want to mix. It doesn't mix very well yet. Later on it's going to mix, but right here where they meet, there's going to be a lot of condensation, a lot of rain. This is what's called a front. It's where uh, two different kinds of air mix. So this is going to be cold, dry air, and actually maybe cold, even humid air with uh, even warmer, more humid air mixing together. And this is going to be a storm that's going to hit us. But you have to see the high pressure system and the low pressure system. So. Here we are in Arcata. Stage one, we have sunny days. Stage two, uh, we have, well, at stage one, we have high pressure, wind from the west, northwest. We're going to have cold nights, chilly in the shade. This is probably a leftover blob of air that got sucked on down from the Arctic. Uh, in wintertime, uh, this high pressure system could leave us with cold uh, air. In summertime, this might be high pressure, hot air, but we're talking about winter. So we're going to be cold right now. Um, in the morning there might be fogs and some clouds, but usually this will burn off by noon. So that's typical when we're sitting underneath a high pressure system. Stage two, what happens is this low pressure system moves to the east and this thing starts approaching us. We start getting high altitude clouds, cirrus clouds if you want to be specific, the feathery, um, feathery clouds that are very high up that the sun can shine through. The winds shift around to the southwest. Uh, this is, um, let's see, the air that's coming in approaching the low pressure system is going to approach from the southwest. That's a really good sign that something's happening is when the wind shifts to the southwest. Lower clouds move in. Now we get a full-on cloud cover. The sun gets blotted out and um, the air starts feeling warmer and humid. That's that tropical or subtropical air coming up to us. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I feel a sense like something's going to happen. Warm, moist air from the southwest, when I go outside and I feel it after a spell of clear, cold days, something's going to happen and I start paying attention to the weather. Uh, at first, you'll get light rain, but then as this frontal boundary approaches, you'll get heavy rain and high winds. When that's overhead, um, that's when you really get your uh, gutters washed out. Uh, that might move, uh, well, after the front passes, the rain stops, and then it gets cleared. Um, clearing happens and temperature drops. However, it's the rate at which this front passes over you may be very quick, in which case you get a short shot of heavy rain, and then it passes, and then it's clear. Or it may be very slow. It may even stall above you. If this front stalls above you, you get a lot of rain for a long period of time. So the rate at which this low pressure system is moving is very important to the weather that you actually experience. As this high pressure system behind the front moves over you, the winds shift back to the northwest. Look at this. This spiraling pattern is bringing cold, relatively not as wet air from the northwest. And so after the storm, you get strong northwest winds and clear cold nights. So this cold air now is on top of you after relatively warm, humid days. I just wanted to say that sometimes when this front comes over and stalls, they call that a pineapple express. That's because I guess uh, pineapples are grown in Hawaii and this air is coming from that general vicinity and it's uh, full of moisture. The Pineapple Express. We get drenched. 
You also sometimes get hail, thunder showers, and or showers for a couple days. In you see all these clouds here. It's for some reason it's unstable air, and so you might get some showers. So cold hail, uh, sudden showers that come and then go. That's after the frontal passage, and usually doesn't add much extra precipitation. Although you can get surprised by that. Okay, so that's what happens in a winter storm sequence. Go ahead and study it. I'll probably ask some questions about it. Uh, make sure you understand it. If you do understand it, you have gone a long way to understanding the, and predicting the weather that's happening outside your house, which I think is a good thing. Okay. Uh, just a couple other factors affecting local climate and weather. Uh, we've talked about latitude and the proximity to large water, which really modulates your climate. If you live next to the ocean, you don't have much uh, weather uh, temperature changes relative to people who live inland. So Redding is really hot and really cold relative to Arcata. Uh, we've talked about season. And lastly, I just wanted to mention topography, elevation. Basically, if there is a mountain in the way of weather, the upwind side gets a lot more rain than the downwind side. And that's because the winds hitting the mountain are lifted. And as they're lifted, the rising air cools and condenses. And all the rain falls on one side. On the other side, as the dewatered air descends, it gets warmer, it gets even drier. There's no water left in the air to fall out. And so that's called a rain shadow. And actually, because in the Humboldt Bay area, we are to the northeast of the King Range, we're a little bit of a rain shadow of the King Range. So the King Range gets a lot of the rain that we would otherwise get. A lot of our rain is stops and falls on the King Range. And then we get maybe one or two inches when they get four or five inches. That is more pronounced uh, in the Central Valley. So the coast ranges of California get a lot more rain on the west side than they do on their east side or in the Central Valley because that has, the rain has been blocked. That happens again with the Sierras. So the, the west side of the Sierra Nevada gets a lot more precipitation than the east side of the Sierras. Just Google Earth it, and you can see that on the east side of the Sierras, it's uh, much drier than on the west side. So that's what I wanted to say about uh, local topography. I'll mention it again when we talk about fog. Oh, I guess I'm going to say it now. Um, I'm not going to uh, talk about this image here. You can pause the video and study it for yourself. Instead, I'm just going to talk you through fog on the West Coast. So this is the coast of California. And this is the Pacific Ocean. And you can see there's a lot of clouds here. And this is low elevation clouds. This is actually fog, just low elevation clouds. And uh, what's going on here? OK, it's a local phenomenon. It relies on cold offshore currents. I mentioned earlier the California current comes down and bumps up against California and upwells. And so this is a region of pretty cold water in water that was already cold to begin with. It's even colder now. So um, you need that cold water offshore. You need a sunny day like we have in summer with a quiet weather pattern. Because if there's a lot of fronts coming and going, then it mixes everything up and fog doesn't form. But when the weather just settles down and there's no, not much wind happening due to larger weather systems, you can get the conditions for fog formation. So here's what happens. First, in the morning, uh, it's going to be cool inland. And so there's not going to be much temperature differential between inland and the water. Uh, if there is fog in the morning, it burns off as the land heats up from the sunshine. So the heats up, it becomes warmer, and air doesn't condense when it gets warmer, it evaporates. And so the morning fog burns off. Uh, but in the early afternoon, the inland heats up a lot. So you know the Central Valley can get quite hot, and these coastal uh, mountains can get really hot. and that causes convection. The air rises there. And as it rises, it pulls air in from offshore. So we start getting a movement of air this way. So this moist offshore, offshore air passes over the cold water. And it's, the water in it condenses into fog. 
and then the fog rolls in. It's pulled in by convection from inland. Look at this right here. This is a San Francisco Bay Area, and uh, this must be the Golden Gate. This is fog streaming into the Golden Gate, and you, when you see this happening, it's just the most magic thing. Well, looks like we are up here. It looks like uh, this is Cape Mendocino. It looks like at this point, um, uh, Humboldt Bay is also getting some fog. Okay, uh, I'm actually going to be quiet for the next three minutes or two minutes or so so you can watch this beautiful video at WIMP showing fog rolling in. that nice fog awesome stuff let's see where are we over here okay uh, lastly I just wanted to point out that coastal zones are much cooler than inland zones because of the cooling effect of the water and but getting back to the redwood country redwoods basically are protected from drier conditions because of their proximity to the ocean redwoods need moisture and they're getting it I wanted to briefly say something about Santa Ana winds. Uh, this is not going to be tested on, but if you, many of my students are from Southern California, and I just wanted to mention this because it's part of our California weather. Occasionally, what happens if you, you get is you get a reversal of the normal airflow caused by high pressure in the Great Basin. When there's high pressure, maybe there's a low pressure system off the coast, then you get winds from the east moving west, easterlies, which is really rare. And because this is a higher elevation, as the winds uh, move to lower elevations, they compress. So you might get fairly, this happens usually in winter time. Um, but what you get is high pressure dry air compressing and getting even drier and maybe even warmer. And so you get these strong easterly winds channeling down from the canyons across these mountains into the lower elevations. And if a fire starts, it can be really a problem because you have very dry conditions, very high winds, and a fire. Uh, couple that with maybe overgrown forests and you have a fire that runs out of control and may burn uh, human structures and so it gets in the newspaper and you hear about it you can see the the smoke from from these fires going inland um, I mean out to sea so this happens in many parts of the earth we call them Santa Ana winds but you may hear them called Chinook winds or phone elsewhere they their winds have been named in different cultures uh, but th that is not a phenomenon that happens much on the north coast in Redwood Country, so I'm just going to skip over that for us. Uh, again, just wanted to point out the National Weather Service uh, and um, hope you, there will be a, uh, an assignment having to do with this. And lastly, I'm just going to say that uh, we should look ahead to climate change and ecotopia. At the end of the course, we'll return to this 
question of climate change and what the predictions are for climate change. Uh, it's hard to predict the future. We do know that, that we've pumped a lot of uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Uh, the scientists pretty much all agree uh, that climate change is a reality, but it's hard to predict the specifics of what climate change is going to bring to us. But uh, uh, for now, since we talked about climate and whether I wanted to raise that, and promise that we'll, we will return to that in the future. What I really hope is that uh, your study of climate and weather uh, affects how you see the world. I wanted this class to help connect you to your natural environment and the weather and climate is a very exciting and interesting part of your natural environment. You're already monitoring it to some extent and uh, you will be for the rest of your life in one way or the other. And I hope you now know more about it than you did and that your learning continues for the rest of your life as it has in mind. Okay, well, I'll uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.